Hey friends, happy Valentine's Day. Today I've got something short and sweet to share with you guys just to kind of show my appreciation for the support you guys have shown me over the years. Whether or not you celebrate Valentine's Day on February 14th, I hope you guys will take the time out of your day to tell somebody you love, a parent, a friend, even your pet, how much they mean to you. Reach out to somebody you haven't talked to in a while but who you really value and let them know how much you care and maybe consider reestablishing that relationship. So today we're painting this cute little watercolor painting of Kara and Tanner exchanging valentines. They're both from my comic 7inch Kara which you guys can read at 7inchkara.com and 7inchkara.tumblr.com and we just celebrated the third launch anniversary for 7inch Kara. I'm going to link the video for that in the cards. So we're going to start off by stretching our watercolor illustration. I have loads of tutorials that include a stretching portion and I even even have some watercolor stretching tutorials here on the channel and over at natosoup.blogspot.com in my watercolor basics section. So I would love it if you guys would check some of those out. I penciled this on Arches watercolor paper. I printed the underdrawing using my Canon printer and I have tutorials on how to print your own blue lines as well. What's great about this technique is the ink I use for my blue lines is water soluble, which means after I give it a good spritz down, it reactivates and I can basically just wash it off the paper, which is why you guys see me stretch the front of my paper, not once, but twice. I'm stretching my watercolor paper on some gator board that's the sort of plastic board that's used for political signs and I find that it works really really well for stretching watercolor comics like my seven inch Kara as well as for stretching watercolor illustrations like the one you guys see here I'm also using 3m blue painters tape the crepe painters tape because it allows the water to kind of absorb into the tape and it adheres better to the paper and I'm using binder clips and bulldog clips to help secure the piece while it's drying and while it's being stretched. I'm using my Daily Driver watercolor palette. This is the mix of watercolors that I use when I'm painting 7-inch Kara. And it's a combination of Winsor Newton, Holbein, Magello, Soho, Daniel Smith, and some Sennelier and M. Graham. So it's basically almost every professional water, professional grade watercolor paint that I happen to really like. And I'm going to be painting today mainly with a Winsor Newton Series 7 Kalinske Sable Brush in size 5. These can be kind of cost prohibitive, but gosh, I love them. For those of you who do have ethical problems with using natural hair brushes, there are also some good synthetics on the market. And I have a few watercolor brush videos that kind of talk about that more in detail. So I'm beginning by using Sennelier's Ultramarine Deep to paint the shadows on their eyes as well as the cast shadows on the ground. And this is a pretty simple little illustration. I'm mostly just coloring the characters themselves. And you guys can tell when I am feeling better when my spirits are up and my health is returning because the variety of shots I choose for my watercolor videos as well as the quality of the paintings themselves goes up drastically. And I want to mention that because I think that's something we kind of forget. Our mood and how we feel physically can really affect our art. And I know a lot of us push ourselves to work even when we're sick because that productivity is so important to us. But I think it makes a pretty drastic difference in the art I create. I like how this piece turned out so much better than I like the piece that I did for Kara's birthday and they were done literally within days of each other but I was still sick and I'd gotten kind of an ugly message on Twitter when I was painting the birthday piece so I wasn't in the best of spirits. So I start with their skin tones I've, and that's a mix of yellow ochre with a little bit of scarlet red. It gives kind of a nice variable uh, Caucasian skin tone. And what's also nice about this color is it layers really well. So as the color evaporates, the saturation of course increases and you can build up depth with the skin tone without having to do a lot of remixing.
For this piece, I wanted the color story to be really tight, really warm red colors since it's Valentine's Day. So I paint the uh, Valentine that Kara's holding with the same scarlet red that I used to mix the skin tone. And I start the chocolate that Tanner's holding with, I wanna say M. Graham's Burnt um Umber. It's a really rich, warm, earthy sort of brown. And maybe they're a little bit embarrassed about exchanging Valentine's, so I added a lot of blush to the cheeks to show that maybe they're a little bit embarrassed about this day. So right now I'm applying a shadow color of ultramarine violet and this is a grise type of effect and what we're basically doing is we're pre-establishing our shadows and this is great if you're going to be painting with say more opaque colors later on or colors that are really prone to lifting because you won't be able to glaze your shadow color on top of it so it's really helpful to establish those colors and I'm using Holbein's I want to say brilliant pink it's a very 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 light pastel opaque pink and I really like this color, even though I don't have an opportunity to use it frequently in 7-inch Kara. And I'm also using Imeldazole Red, I want to say. I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. But it's a warm, synthetic, earthy sort of red color. So it's great for painting like bricks. And I'm paint using that as the undercolor for Tanner's Breeches. And then I'm using the same Burnt Sienna, I mean Burnt Umber, I'm sorry, for his little clogs. So most of my watercolor illustrations are really rendered. They make use of a lot of layers of color to build up contrast and depth. And not everybody works with watercolor this way. Even though my watercolors don't reflect this, I do really enjoy sort of light, sketchy pastel watercolors as well as really vibrant and loose watercolors. For the kind of watercolors I do, which are more inspired by traditional kid lit books and more inspired by those more mannered, more developed, time-consuming ways of handling watercolor and color pencil. I use, I love to use cotton rag watercolor papers when I'm doing standalone watercolor illustrations like this one because they can really hold on to the pigments and they can take a lot of working without everything turning to mud. But when I'm painting Kara pages, I actually use Canson Montval, which is a cellulose-based watercolor paper. And while it doesn't have quite the same working properties as a good cotton rag paper would, it's pretty dang good for a cellulose paper. It's quite affordable. It comes in the format that I want to work in, in terms of size and it runs through my printer so it just seems like a really good match and if you guys want to check out and compare how this illustration looks maybe compared to seven inch Kara pages you guys can read the first six chapters for free at seveninchkara.com or seveninchkara.tumblr.com currently i'm on hiatus i actually have chapters seven through eight with a bonus chapter those are all painted and lettered but i'm waiting to share them until after the seven inch Kara kickstarter and we're kickstarting for volume two i'm still working on illustrations to kind of complete that but if you guys would like to learn more about the second volume and you'd like to see some behind the scenes comic process that i don't necessarily share with everybody you can sign up for the mailing list at natosoup.com slash kara kickstart i'm going to have links to everything including the materials used in this tutorial in the description below so don't worry you don't have to like hurry up and type it in to check it out so for Kara's little romper, I'm using Magello's, it's not opera pink, it's like Compo's Rose. 
and it's a little bit cooler than opera pink it scans a lot better than opera pink my scanner has a lot of trouble with fluorescence but it's still a really saturated warm color and generally i don't dress kara this way usually for kara in the comic i dress her in very natural colors colors that could be derived from natural pigments and i've done a lot of research on what is attainable from natural pigments versus what we get from synthetic pigments and I try to reflect that in the colors that I choose for Kara because she needs to blend in with the grass. And it also reflects the fact that her family's kind of isolated from other Lilliputians and from humans. And they are very reliant on what can be traded for or scavenged. So materials might see several, several cycles of wear before Kara gets them. But since it's Valentine's Day, I thought it would be fun to dress Kara in something very cute and color coordinated. So we have a, a very matching outfit. Now Tanner is about a year older than Kara and he's the son of a messenger Lilliputian family and in the first volume he's still an apprentice. He's still learning the different routes and he's still learning the best way to get from place to place and how to behave as a messenger. In volume three he's going to make a reappearance and his part is going to be greatly expanded. So I'm really looking forward to getting cracking on volume three, chapter nine, and exploring the world of Seven Inch Kara a lot more. So if you find this sort of stuff interesting, if you like to see the world from a whole new perspective, and that's one of the things that I love about Seven Inch Kara, is it really invites me to explore the world from other perspectives and from other viewpoints and to kind of examine the differences and how those differences make us richer as individuals and make us richer as a community. Um, but if you're interested in the world building that I can't really get into into 7-inch Kara, I have three Lilliputian zines that you guys might enjoy. And I usually do them in October or during October. And the first one follows different Lilliputian careers. The second one follows Lilliputian families, different types of Lilliputians, Lilliputian pets, and Lilliputian holidays. And then the third one is going to be an herbal that focuses on the different plants that Lilliputians live, use in their day-to-day -day lives. And the first two are finished. I have print copies of the first two, and those are gonna be a reward for um, the Kickstarter. And once I finish with volume two, I'm going to make the third Lilliputian living into a full on zine. So there'll be three Lilliputian living zines that will be available as backer tiers. So as with many of my other watercolor demonstrations and walkthroughs and processes and demos and, and tutorials, you guys may notice that I work lean or fat over lean. And what that means is I get my really thin saturations, my really thin layers down first, and I develop the contrast through that. And then as the forms develop, I work progressively tighter, more saturated with thicker mixes. So most of my painting utilizes wet over dry techniques. This is known as layering or as known as glazing, kind of depending on which context you're using it in. And then as we start to add in tighter details, it becomes dry over dry where see, that's a little bit um, misleading because with watercolor, you still do have to add some water. You really shouldn't just paint straight from the tube. That's not how watercolors are designed. They're not really like acrylics or oils, which are kind of designed to be used in very thick saturations. Watercolors are designed to be used very diluted. Um, but dry over wet or dry over dry, you have just a little bitty bit of water in your brush and you pick up a lot of pigment with it and then you apply it. But it needs to be wet enough that it will actually flow onto the paper. Otherwise, you start getting kind of a dry brush technique where there's lots of skips and starts, which can be very useful and can be very pretty, but it's 
a technique that you want to be able to control and you want to be able to choose when you want those stops and starts and when you want a nice clean fluid line and I pretty much used just the series 7 watercolor brush or Klinsky sable brush for this because it's able to deliver that sort of nuance and that sort of control the Klinsky sable fibers hold a lot of water they hold a lot of pigment but the tip is also capable of giving you really 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 fine lines fine details and a lot of control which is really nice on more temperamental or textured papers because it kind of it's stiff enough that it's gonna be able to stand up to the paper and give you what you want and be able to stay in the lines but it's soft enough that you'll still be able to do larger fills and to be able to fill larger areas quickly So out of curiosity, I generally try to edit out when I'm mixing colors and I try to not have my color palette in the shot, not because I'm ashamed of it or anything. It's just a space consideration. I figure you guys would prefer to be zoomed in and actually see what's going on rather than to see what colors I'm grabbing. But I would like to hear from you guys. Would you prefer to see the color mixing stages and the palette? Would that be beneficial for you guys? Or would you prefer to just watch the painting itself? Let me know down in the comments below. I look forward to hearing back from you guys. So at this stage, I'm almost finished with the watercolor part of this illustration and I'm going in with a much smaller brush and I'm painting dry over wet to add like the eyelashes and the eye lines um, to do their eyebrows, maybe to reestablish freckles and to kind of ink the piece using like a darker variation of the same local color just to kind of cover up the pencil lines and help tie everything together. And once I finished watercoloring, I go in with just a little bit of color pencil. I'm using a white Derwent Inktense watercolor pencil as well as some white gouache just to kind of add back in some highlights and that's gonna kind of adjust the contrast a little bit. So when you're watercoloring over pencil, your contrast and how you handle contrast and how much contrast you add is actually gonna be very different than if you were working over an inked piece. And this was a penciled piece, so I really needed to make sure that I got my forms rendered enough and then went back in and added more highlights. So once it had a chance to dry, I go ahead and I remove all the clips that were kind of holding things in place. I went in just to add a couple of extra details and kind of tighten things up. And then when that dried, I went ahead and I removed the blue painter's tape pulling away from the illustration at a 90 degree angle. So you guys see some of these little blue remainders of the tape. Sometimes it gets stuck 
where the clamps or the clips clamp down on the paper. You can actually use a masking fluid uh, pick up one, a masking fluid eraser and just kind of scrub at it and it'll gently remove that remaining adhesive. So it's really easy and you don't have to use your fingernails to do it. So I want to thank you guys so much for joining me, for watching me paint this illustration. I hope you guys have a happy, safe, and warm Valentine's Day. Please take time to tell somebody you love how you feel and that you care about them. It doesn't have to be romantic love. It can be platonic love. It can be filial love, love for a pet, love for a parent, love for a friend, love for somebody you admire. But take the time out to tell somebody that you care and reach out to somebody and let them know how you feel. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you guys enjoyed watching me paint this illustration. I look forward to hearing from you guys down in the comments below. Happy Valentine's Day, y'all. Bye.